Welcome everyone to CivilNet. We're joined today by high-tech entrepreneur, executive investor, and winery owner, Adam Kablanian. Adam, thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thank you for uh, having this interview. Absolutely. So uh, first I wanna talk about tech. I understand you first came to Armenia in 1998, and since then you've been heavily involved in the development of the IT sector here. Can you tell us what that experience has been like and how have you seen the tech scene evolve and change over the years? Yes, my first time to Armenia was 1998 and I had a company called Virage Logic uh, in Silicon Valley, which we took public on NASDAQ in 2000. But prior to that, our idea was to get the best talent worldwide and connect them to Virage Logic so they can produce intellectual property in the memory space and make uh, semiconductor intellectual property available for the worldwide customer base. So I was actually very pleasantly surprised uh, when I met a couple of people in Silicon Valley that came from Armenia. They are Soviet uh, educated scientists, high caliber. And during that time, uh, Silicon Valley was experiencing a you know, shortage of labor. So it prompted me to come and visit Armenia to see if I can find qualified talent to help grow the company. Prior to um, Armenia, with three months prior to that, I went to India and opened a, opened a branch office there. So the, the idea was not new, it has nothing really specifically connected to Armenia, but I just found that there is a huge amount of talent here and it's worth taking the risk. And uh, I wonder, you know, since, you know, going from 1998 to, to 2024, how do you evaluate the tech scene here now? And where do you see it going in the future? In your view, what is the next logical point for Armenia's tech scene? Well, I have to say I'm very pleasantly surprised and, uh, and encouraged how the tech scene improved or developed over the years. In 1998, we had no IT industry in Armenia. I remember Sam Simonian had Epigee Lab and I came to Armenia with Virage Logic. There was another company, HPL. Uh, uh, and those are the three of us who start hiring the best people. I mean, it was amazing some of the, 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 the quality of candidates. So we quickly trained them into, you know, communication, emails, how to interact with customers, how to do meetings, all these disciplines were not there. And we invested quite a bit of resources from the US uh, uh, know-how, training. We grew the site to 150 people. Uh, we were considered kind of the, the best IT company to work uh, in Armenia. And um, I just want to tell you something that happened with Synopsys. Synopsys approached us in 2003 in Silicon Valley to acquire Virage Logic, but we did not agree on the price. Mm -hmm. During due diligence, they found out that we had a, a fantastic operation in Armenia. So since we did not agree on the price, independently they came <laughs> because they were operating in India and China and they had a big turnover and it was not very stable. They were looking for an excellent location where the attrition rate was very, very low. So we had like one or 2% annual mm. just because of immigration. And uh, because of that, actually Synopsys came, acquired a team of scientists and gradually built the operation. Um, uh, ironically, in 2010, they decided to acquire us again. They pay us like 40% premium. And now Virage Logic is part of Synopsys mm. and they're continuing the success of Virage Logic. So for the audience, Virage Logic was the number one embedded memory provider worldwide. We have 700 people worldwide, global operation, India, Armenia, four different locations in the US and global sales and marketing team. We were serving the, the top tier semiconductor companies. And one story I like to tell the Armenian audience is, the first iPod product from Apple was designed here in Armenia. It had three components of memory. It was done by Armenian scientists. Mm. So it was, um, and all the gaming stuff, Xbox, all of the memories and tests were done in Armenia. So I'm really proud of what the team has accomplished uh, in Armenia. Looking forward, I just did not imagine that we will grow this fast. 
I help others come to Armenia, like Ali Sayan and uh, uh, National Instruments, Aram Saltian, and you know other people start copying success stories. Before you knew it, took off. And now I'm I'm happy to say that we have over forty thousand high tech workers, high paying jobs, contributing between seven to eight percent of the GDP. So it's it's really transformative. At the time, I was purely acting opportunistically. I was not thinking strategically. So I'm gonna not gonna sit down and tell you that oh, I had the vision of transforming. No, that was not the case. I was here purely to take advantage of the resources, low cost resources to to make our company profitable and global. Yeah, that's fantastic. And I think that that little uh, anecdote about the the iPod and the Xbox is very interesting because I don't think a lot of people realize that. Um, when I speak with folks uh, in the industry here on the ground, something that comes up over and over again is the need to uh, improve the education system. And I know that that's um, a point of view that you share. And to that end, you've also been deeply involved with educational efforts here. Uh, can you tell us more about that side of what you do uh, and also about the intersection of tech and education more broadly? Yeah, so after like the initial growth phase where we were tapping on Soviet tri uh, the trained scientists, you know, they had an excellent education system. But over time, uh, their little investment went into higher education in Armenia and start becoming more and more difficult for high quality tech workers to be available for companies to hire. Plus we had huge competition because of the success stories of us and others. Many companies wanted to come here but over time, as I said, you know, there's fewer and fewer high quality graduates. So it was very obvious to us and to others that the education system was not producing high quality experts. So how do you go about it? And so that's where I got interested in education. Uh, and I joined the board of AUA about 10 years ago. And recently I co-founded with uh, Pachi Sahagian, Mary Papazian, uh, Armenian Societies of Fellows to really start the process of bringing global expertise from diaspora, Armenian and non Armenian, to structurally help uh, in a collaborative, cooperative way to revamp the education system. It's not going to be done overnight, requires a generation, but, there are, but we have a gap. And how do you fill the gap? You fill that gap by bringing, buying expert, putting research centers here, collaborating with world-class uh, Armenian scientists and researchers, applying for grants, doing some of the work in Armenia, helping the local researchers to come up to standard until we start producing high quality education systems. So it's really, really challenging because without that, I don't believe Armenia can be a tech center in the future. And we're talking about now IT sector, there's another important sector I like to mention, which is the defense sector. Uh, there was no defense sector before 2016. After 2020 war, it was apparent that we need to rely on our own resources in many ways. And now I'm happy to, to see that there's 50 different startups. Uh, some startups have actually products developing, but we need deep tech workers. These are not software programs. Yeah, there's software aspect to it, but there are lots of deep tech knowledge that unfortunately does not exist in Army or used to exist, but now it's not available. So how do you revamp that? Uh, and that, that, that to me is a key challenge that I, I like to work on next, so. Absolutely, and I'm glad that you brought up the Armenian Society of Fellows because I would like to ask you about that. Uh, but before we do, I just want to make sure it's very, very clear for, uh, for people who are listening who may not be familiar with uh, Armenia's education system. Can you break down why, in your view, the education system now is not producing um, the type of talent that is needed for further development? What exactly are those gaps that, uh, that you're working to, to bridge? Well, there are many gaps, the different components. First, we had the brain drain for many, many years. So lots of qualified scientists, researchers, and academicians left the country. They were the people who would be helping tutor and prepare the next generation. Uh, many, uh, because of the harsh economic environment, many of the, uh, uh, the uh, students gravitate toward business, accounting, which is all fine because the service industry also need to grow. That's kind of easier to, to, to provide 
with multiple program uh, with multiple different certification and 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 curriculum where science requires you know if, if, especially you want to go to stem education it requires huge amount of capital resources labs and the country didn't have these resources so over time many many students you know went to easier discipline i'm not trying to trivialize accounting and finance and economy uh, history. But, you know, the investment in R&D labs and equipment were not there, plus the big drain. That's really, to me, was the big issue. Plus, the payout was not there until people start thinking, wow, you know, you can make $3,000, $4,000 a, a month salary becoming a programmer. So, and that didn't become apparent until about seven, eight years ago, so. Absolutely. So. Um to go back to the Armenian Society of Fellows and to continue a bit with our um, conversation on education, um, ASOF, for those who don't know, is an effort to connect Armenian scholars, academics, thought leaders, business leaders uh, from the diaspora with their counterparts here in Armenia. Uh, the uh, ASOF uh, annual conference just wrapped up here in Yerevan. So what can you tell us about the organization in general and what uh, news and updates can you give us from this most recent conference you guys had? Thank you. Uh, actually, if you look at ASOF, we have three main pillars. Our mission is based on one is to transport Armenia, science and technology. So that's kind of first priority. Second, to preserve and renew Armenian heritage for the 21st century. And third, to provide and promote cultural dialogue and cooperation between diaspora and, 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 and Armenia uh, at multiple levels. So that's really the the, the three pillars of our mission. Uh, the best way we thought we could, you know, structurally bring uh, scientists, researchers from abroad. And we have lots of qualified high-level scientists through well-known university that do top, uh, top level research is to open center of excellence or research centers. So we have six initiatives in that. And four of them is really uh, focused on sciences, like we just initiated the Center for Intelligent Compute Computing. We're bringing, you know, uh, uh, GPUs from NVIDIA, and that's about in the process mm -hmm. to have an intelligent computing center where we can do research both locally and also bring international scientists residing here in these research centers, apply grants, you know, from abroad and, and bring resources. Uh, center for Aerospace uh, Engineering. I mean, we did not have any aerospace in Armenia. We still don't. So we're trying to you know, the future is in space, so we need to really get there. And we do have lots of uh, uh, qualified people who can uh, uh, start this center. And also focus on uh, the third sector is to on education reform. So working with various institutions uh, in Armenia through our educators who focus on education to be able to come up with program suggestions and how to revamp that. Of course, we also have council ex expert on preserving the, our heritage. So that's another initiative. And, uh, and we're organizing conferences to, the reason we did these conferences so we can have a good dialogue between diaspora in Armenia, private government officials. So to really, in a transparent way, discuss the issues and how we can then over time solve them. So that's really the purpose of ASAF. ASAF would dissolve as an organization within 20 years because we don't want to be an organization that, you know, uh, we just want to enable this transformation and get out. So hmm. that's really our purpose. So it will self dissolve within 20 years. Hmm. Setting aside tech and education uh, just for a second, another one of your ventures here in Armenia is wine. You founded uh, Alex Andrea Winery here in 2017. What motivated that decision and what has that experience been like for you? Thank you. This is uh, wine is my passion. Uh, I do lots of other things in life, but wine is something I uh, love being with. I have not met many people who love wine and they're not good people. So, uh, <laughs> so I always wanted to make wine. I want to make exceptionally good wine. So I had options to make wine in Napa Valley or versus Armenia. So I decided to do Armenia because I've been coming here. It's my country. Um, and after careful consideration, I decided uh, to build the winery in 2017 because I convinced one of 
my friends who came hiking with me, and he's an excellent winemaker, that he will make my wine in Armenia. And I want to make the best wine because I looked at Armenia. Armenia has all the uh, the attributes to make great wine. It, it's under 45 golden uh, parallel. It has abundance of water, altitude, 300 days of sun, volcanic, mineral soil. So it has really all the ingredients to make great wine. So my approach is different than many other wineries approach. I wanted to express Armenia's terroir to the rest of the world. So I'm interested in making great wine. It can be indigenous varietal, it can be international varietal. So I imported many vines from Europe and France uh, to have international varietals as well as local varietals. So I have three different locations, one in Brosian, one in Noriadesia, one in Rindarini. And each location based on detailed soil analysis and uh, position analysis of the vineyard, I plant the best vineyards that c will do well there. So now I have a great winemaker. Uh, I have great location, great terroir. And I have the best varietal again that does well in that terroir. Plus, I've worked with uh, Armas Victoria to outsource. I didn't have facilities to make my wine at her. She has state of the art facilities. So I have the best ingredient and plus the, the excellent terroir in Armenia. So that's really how I approach winemaking in Armenia. So I'm not married to native or indigenous varietal. I'm not married to international. I just want to make the best wine. And so far, I think I'm very successful in doing that. It's very, very short time that I've introduced my wine in the market. And that's wonderful. And I'll just say for our viewers very quickly, that's Victoria Aslanyan from uh, Armas Winery. And we actually have an interview with her up on our website. So you can check that out uh, if you're interested. I want to ask what the reception of your project has been within the wine industry here, because I think there is a lot of focus on indigenous grape varieties and reviving um, ancient Armenian winemaking traditions. And you are going a different route. You have, of course, some indigenous varietals, but you are also, um, as you mentioned, working with, uh, with international varietals and just using the Armenian terroir, as you're saying. Uh, what has the reception been like for you within the industry? Uh, the reception has been mixed. First of all, I want to acknowledge all the pioneers that came before me. I'm not starting a wine industry in Armenia from scratch. There was Vahe Koshkerian, there's Ernekian, there's uh, uh, Victoria Armas, Aslanian, and others, uh, Zora. Uh, and, and, and what I wanted to do, um, as I said, you know, and have the expression of the terroir. Uh, many winemakers here in Armenia, they have their own vineyard, so they have they don't have that luxury. So they have they're in Vyatsor, so they have RNE, they have Voskeha, they have Gramat. And so they have very limited choice. I coming in, I didn't have any limitations. I can do whatever I want. So that's really why. Many people criticize me that I don't believe in uh, the Armenian indigenous varietal or I mean the potential of Armenian wine, the way they express it. And I basically tell them, how is it that I don't believe in it? I'm spending $10 million creating winery <laughs> in, Ar in Armenia and, and, and trying to express the terroir. So, and you know, the proof is in the pudding. You know, the first vintage we have, actually we did a, a mixture of RNE, uh, not RNE, Voskehat and Chardonnay. And we presented to Decanter, we won the silver award. So hmm. it was okay, Chardonnay and, and, and Boscat, which was not done in Armenia before. Last year, the 2022 vintage Chardonnay won two silver medal, the first 100% you know, Chardonnay. So again, I, I know my Brosian uh, vineyard will do excellent Chardonnay. And this year I'm expecting to do my, my first Pinot Noir. Hmm. I've done the Riesling, I have not introduced it to the market again. This, and whoever, we're talking about wine experts, they love the Riesling, said this is such a unique offering. So again, from a business point of view, I like to introduce Armenia through an international variety to the world, uh, to, to wine lovers around the world, because they know what Chardonnay is, they know what Pinot Noir is, they know what Cabernet is. And they said, oh, let me drink, you know, Pinot Noir from uh, from Armenia. I you know, I don't even know where Armenia, but through that they can discover where Armenia is. And they can compare their Burgundy to our Pinot Noir and do compare and contrast. And through which I can also now introduce him to many of the Armenian varietals, which I'm also planting. 
just to add one more thing on that. So my second uh, thinking is I have three different vineyards. I want to do r and &E in all three. And every year, every vintage will be different. Not only different from year to year, but all be different from the different year. Mm -hmm. So that way our consumers or uh, customers will experience different terroirs through the same grape variety. So, and I have lots of leeway to do mix and match of different varietals, different terroirs. So look, I'm, I'm a curious guy. I'm, I like to experiment. I like to discover new flavors and and i like to explore new taste and that's really so i'm in a journey of i'm like a kid in the candy store trying to do different things and uh, it's kind of expensive experiment but i'm loving it and um just to wrap up i want to take this back to where we started with um tech very quickly i'm wondering i just think you have such an interesting um variety of experiences in terms of the private sector here in armenia do you see some similarities between tech and wine, let's say, in terms of things that are holding Armenia back what, from the next step or what needs to be done in the future. I was wondering if you could maybe compare and contrast a little bit what you've seen in the two industries. They're both something that we hear all about, the potential of Armenia's tech, the potential of Armenia's wine. What uh, is your kind of diagnosis? Uh, let me go to tech for a second. When I first came to Armenia in 1998 to uh, establish my branch office for Virage Logic, it was, there was a potential energy there and which has well-educated Soviet scientists. So I tap into that and I unleash that potential energy uh, through others who came to get advantage of the education system previous to being independent. Now we have to rebuild that as we discussed earlier. So the same with the wine industry. Mm. It's a high margin business if you can make great wine. But if you cannot get, get, uh, make great wine, it doesn't matter. You, you, we cannot make money or survive making cheap wine. So that's why I gravitated toward making exceptionally good wine. I'm not there yet. And uh, imagine if we can establish Armenia as a, a, a wine region that everybody, it's a terroir, everybody understands. Then you can start selling Armenian wine for 50, 60, 70, $100. And we know what the cost is. The cost is, you know, below ten, fifteen dollars, depending on if it's a reserve or not. So it's a high margin business, and I think that can unleash the potential of Armenia from economic development, from tourism. So it has what I call force multiplier. So I do this comparison between the two. We have the the potential because of all the elements: water, soil, the being in the forty-five uh, degree uh, golden uh, parallel you know, uh, the high altitude, the 300. So we have everything that there's this potential. We just need to exploit it using technology, using uh, making excellent products and then exporting it and presenting Armenia in, the, in those lights. So, Well, Adam, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. This is an absolutely fascinating conversation. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Mark. Appreciate it. And thank you to all of our viewers for joining us on CivilNet.